This is a long one, so buckle up. Fold those tray tables and put your seats in the upright position. I was a flight attendant 20 years ago. The flight that made me quit was from South Bend, Indiana to Minneapolis. It started out with a funny story of having an adult star on our little regional flight. 50 seat CRJ, I was the only flight attendant. I got a chuckle of how amped the gate agent was about it. He was obviously a fan. Anyways, everything else was normal other than it not being a very full flight. We take off and I'm in the jump seat, chilling and waiting for the first ding to tell me we're out of sterile cockpit over 10,000 feet high when the vibration system suddenly kicks on. It was then that my oh shit reflexes kicked in because all I can smell is burning, though there isn't any smoky haze. For a hot minute, I thought I was imagining it, but when I looked up, one of the passengers in front of me makes eye contact and gives me a look that confirms I'm not the only one smelling it. No one else notices. Again, it was odd, but the first three rows were vacant since the flight was only half full. So for the first time ever, I reached up and grabbed the phone to the cockpit and hit the emergency button, which alerts the cockpit but not any of the passengers, unless they know what the flashing light means above my head. The captain answers, and it sounds like he's Darth Vader, since the two of them have their oxygen masks on. I said quietly into the phone, what the fuck is happening? They tell me they don't know, and they need me to get up and check behind the galley cart, the lavatory and then pull up to the hatch to the avionics bay since they can't figure out where it's coming from and there aren't any alarms going off. Apparently air traffic control couldn't see from the ground if we were on fire either. So I try to as calmly as I can move through the cabin without making any sort of scene even though I am pretty much thinking we're all going to die at this point and my throat is burning from breathing in the fumes. Again, no one noticed and I'm grateful seeing as the three of us crew members were on the same, we're going to die wavelength. Literally nobody even batted an eyelash at me crawling on the floor and pulling up the hatch to the avionics bay. I still have no idea how no one thought that was out of the ordinary. So there was nothing that I could see on my side, no visible fire or smoke. I call back to the cockpit and they say that thankfully they're going to let us land and that while we wait for clearance, they're going to vent the cabin to clear some of the fumes. At this point, I buckle myself back into the jump seat and try not to look freaked out as I face the 25 souls in the seats in front of me. As the captain announces to the aircraft that there are fumes and we need to vent them as we need to get back to the airport due to mechanical issues. Yeah, blank stares are aimed in my direction and I just smile and nod as if this is standard procedure. None of this is standard. So the venting is supposed to feel like a little puff of air next to your ears, but it felt like one of those air cannons punching you in the side of your face, which was just delightful. But soon after, we were on the ground safely, and I get to work, getting everyone off this missile to hell, so I can have my own freakout moment in private. The two pilots and myself wind up chain-smoking out in front of the airport and not speaking to each other for about a half an hour. What caused all of this was that the engine had been washed out that morning at the maintenance bay, but it was not rinsed or ran properly to let the chemicals burn off or rinse out. That was what was causing the fumes. An hour later, we were back on the same aircraft and flew back to Minneapolis without issue. I quit the week after. The second scary encounter being a flight attendant was hearing the warning messages to the captain during takeoff once. Imagine being in the jump seat and hearing right behind you, winds here, winds here, pull up, pull up, while trying to act like everything is cool. I hated that airline so damn much. My best friend at school and I used to go over to one another's home often. His family was always really welcoming and nice to me. I was encouraged to turn up whenever I felt like it. 
On occasion, I would turn up, and my friend wouldn't be there, but his mom would be like, Oh hey, come on in, it's great to see you. Why don't you hang out here for a bit? I just have to do a little bit of shopping. So could you keep an eye on the place? There's snacks in the fridge. My friend's mom and my mom were very close, so we had a great relationship between our families. I would often stay home for her if no one was home. This experience takes place when I was asked by my mom to go over to my friend's house with some vegetables our grandmother grew in her garden. It was about lunchtime when I headed over. I pressed the doorbell to their home, but no one came to the door. I guessed that no one was in. That was fine, because I was entrusted with the location of their spare key. They hid it in case of emergencies. On times like this, when they were out, and I was sent to return something, I knew to leave it on their living room table, and lock up and return the key where I found it. It was pretty routine. So I took the key out and unlocked the door and headed inside. As soon as I got inside, I sensed the presence of someone in the house with me. I instantly knew that there was someone upstairs. I don't know, I guess I heard a noise or something. I thought, this is out of the ordinary. Someone should be down here, and it was Sunday after all. I guessed that my friend or his mom was upstairs, perhaps ill and then I somehow convinced myself that one of them had collapsed or something. So I set the bag of vegetables down in the entryway, and then headed in and upstairs. I thought that there could be a thief or an intruder up there, so I did my best attempt of being one with the shadows. In my mind, I moved as silently as a ninja. I was a kid, so lay off. Let me just explain the upstairs floor plan. If you're upstairs, from the back, there's a storage room, my friend's room and the toilet, and then my friend's mom's room. If you were to crane your head from the stairs, you'd pretty much see and hear anything that's going on up there. When I stealthily got to the top of the stairs, I didn't look because I heard some strange sound. It's like a pa, pa, pa sound. Maybe it was an air leak, like the sound of a tire being deflated. It was really weird. I heard the sound then travel across the hall towards my friend's room. I thought, oh man, there's something weird going on here. I don't think that it's my friend or his mom making that noise. I just climbed the rest of the stairs and headed towards my friend's room. I was careless or brave, but it happened. I craned my head around the door frame and I saw a man in his room. He was spitting on the floor. That was the source of the sound. It was incredibly gross. I was completely lost for words. It was like I was dreaming. He spun around and looked my way. He didn't seem at all surprised by my presence. He even gave me a cheerful greeting. Oh, hello. I felt awkward enough to respond. Oh, hi. That's all I could muster up. I was still very confused. A few seconds or so crawled by, and then I asked, What are you doing? Oh, just keeping my ex in her place, showing her who's boss. This is how you do it. I looked around my friend's room, and his toys, his dresser, his chest of drawers, and his clothes and his wardrobe were covered in this man's spit. I was stunned. There was someone who was completely out of their mind stood there in my friend's bedroom. A thought jumped into my mind. Get the police. I ran downstairs and grabbed my grandmother's vegetables and ran to the police station. Three officers accompanied me back to my friend's house. They headed upstairs, but they said that they couldn't find anyone in the house. My friend and his mom, who'd been out, arrived back to their home to be greeted by the flashing lights of a police car and officers holding notebooks. By the time they'd heard my story and heard from the officers, they were both in tears. It turns out that the man I had seen in my friend's bedroom spitting on everything was my friend's dad. Apparently he'd been searching for my friend's home after he got divorced from his wife. I have never met someone with that much malice. I never thought that an adult would do that to their own flesh and blood. Well, my friend's mom said to her son, we will throw out everything he spat on. 
My friend reacted at first with anger. He actually had to be restrained by an understanding officer. I helped calm him down, and I'm not ashamed to say that I had tears in my eyes too. My family gave some money to my friend's mom. His dad even spat on his underwear. Can you believe that? We wanted to help, but not pity. The money we gave them was given out of love, not obligation, righteousness, or sympathy. There are decent people out in the world, and I personally would never let that bastard's actions cloud my impression of those who do good out there. This is why the story is so hard to share. There's no lesson, there's nothing to be garnered, except from disappointment in the man who committed those foul deeds in his ex-wife's empty house. My dad and my brother took turns in picking my friend and his mom up from work and school and dropping them off. I was too young for a license. The police let their intentions be known too. My friend's dad never came back. My friend has an older sister, and we all think she's being stalked. It's ongoing, but I want to share what's happening currently. My friend's sister has been staying with my friend for a while now to get away from it all and repel her stalker. She said it's like living in a nightmare. I wanted to do something nice for her, so I offered to take them both out for dinner to take their minds off of things. We sat down to dinner, and things were going well until I saw my friend's sister's face drop. She began to tremble. I felt bad for asking them to come out. Maybe it was too soon. Then she muttered. He sat behind me. I looked behind her, and I saw an old man with an unnaturally creepy smile. He was peering towards our table. He made me feel nauseous. He was just gross. He was the stalker. My friend had seen this guy following her sister before, so we were beyond it being a coincidence or a case of paranoia. My friend had had enough. She stood up and went over to his table and said loudly, If you don't stop following my sister, then I'm going to the police. A few tables of people looked over, but the old man just sat there smiling that insane smile. After a few moments, he got up and stepped away from his table and left. His expression didn't change. He just kept smiling. We thought that that bit of public embarrassment might be enough to put the creep off and make him leave my friend's sister alone. We were convinced it would work, and it turned out to be a correct prediction. Over the coming days, we would all joke about how easy it was. Everything came to a standstill for her sister, and a sense of normality was resumed in her life. However... Just as soon as it ended, it seemed to start again. This time, the old man's target of torment was different. This time he was stalking my friend and not her sister, and he was a little more cunning in the method of stalking this time round. The old man began to haunt her life. He would just appear any place she went, but always at a distance or appearing inconspicuous. I will give you some examples. If she was out taking a walk, or simply heading home, the old man would appear on his bike riding towards her or from behind her. He would smile that creepy smile of his as he passed her by. He would be there during rush hour in the subway where crowds are gathered. It made her feel as if she had no escape from him. In places where it was difficult to move or get away quickly, she'd see that weirdo and his smile. Enough was enough. My friend went to the police. Unfortunately, they weren't able to help. They said that because he actually hasn't done anything except smile at her and her sister, they couldn't do anything. She left the station frustrated and with a feeling of vulnerability. The old man and his behavior got worse. He was everywhere. She thought that the police might have been able to intervene when she saw him at college on campus, but again, they weren't able to help or offer any kind of protection. To the untrained eye, he was just an old man who was walking around smiling. What's the harm in that? She tried to mobilize all of her friends to help to discourage his behavior, 
but to our surprise, some of her friends didn't believe her. They said she was grasping at straws. She must have felt quite alone at the time. I believed her though. I had first-hand experience. I saw that creep with my own eyes. Plus, anyone who knew my friend well enough would say she's far from a liar or an exaggerator. It was helpless. Every day she grew more nervous and worn down, and every day the old man just smiled at her. He never did anything, he just watched her and smiled. She eventually dropped out of college and has grown less and less responsive to my calls and messages. I haven't really heard from her lately, and it's really worrying me. I feel as if we are right on the edge of something happening. Maybe I should speak up and yell at him like she did for her sister. But if I did that, wouldn't he just start stalking me? I don't know. Recently, I got in contact with her sister, and I asked how she's doing. She thought that she was just wrapped up with studies. She didn't know what had been going on. I don't know what will come of this, but I'm hoping she's just laying low for a while. I hope that creep hasn't escalated his stalking. This was a horrible thing to experience. It happened when I was running late. I finished work later than I wanted to that night, so I was rushing home through the neon-lit downtown area of my city. I saw something as I was rushing that made me stop in my tracks. There was a little girl in one of the alleyways. She must have only been about eight or nine years old. This part of the city at this time of night was no place for a girl of her age. I thought to myself as I looked her way. I noticed that she was stood in an alleyway next to a well-established gentleman's club. Stripping and much more went on in there, so I'm told. Anyway, she shouldn't have been there. I was a little worried for her. She was wearing a red school bag and it looked to be filled to the brim. It looked quite the burden for the little girl to be carrying. I wondered if she'd gotten herself lost. She began to head further into the alley, and I went after her. I didn't need to second-guess myself. I had to find out if she was alright. She was walking in the darkness of the alley all alone. Her head was down. Is everything alright? Is your mother nearby? I asked tentatively. She said nothing, just shook her head to indicate no. How about your dad? Is he around? Her face looked as if it turned to stone in that moment. He's so far away. What the hell? I thought to myself. The little girl turned around and started heading off further into the alley. I reached out to stop her, and I ended up grabbing her by her bag. I must have caught a clasp or a clip on her bag, because before I knew it, the contents of her bag spill out and cascade onto the floor. In her bag, amongst her textbooks, was a large transparent bag of white powder. No way. I heard myself mutter softly. I called the cops. I had to. Something wasn't right here, and I was really worried about the girl and why she had what looked like to be drugs in her bag. I heard from the police afterwards, and it turns out that the young girl was being forced to work as a drug courier by her stepdad. He was apparently part of the Yakuza. Her biological father was in prison, and her mother had deserted her and left her with the gangster years ago. Her stepfather was arrested, and the girl was taken into care. The officer mentioned that she will likely go to an orphanage. I hope she's doing well and is happy. To think that three adults let her down so terribly really puts a knot in my stomach. I really feel for that girl. No childhood should involve being a drugs mule. This world can be so cruel sometimes. I work overnights at a 24-hour diner. You can probably guess what company. I'm used to weird people and odd things happening but tonight was too much. 
The restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line, and my cook and I went out back to smoke. We could hear someone yelling in the distance, but we get a lot of homeless people that come through town that are usually harmless, so we just shrugged it off as weird and went back inside. Later I came out again to smoke and throw away some trash in the dumpster that's next to the field. It was stupid to go over to it, but I hadn't heard that scream again. As I'm walking away from the dumpster, I hear, Hey, come here. Hey, come here. It was much closer than when we heard this person screaming for the first time. I went inside and got my co-worker, who owns a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it out into the field, which again, not smart, and we know that, but we couldn't see where he was. But the guy kept saying, Hey girl, come here. I called the cops by this point, because it was just too weird. As soon as I get off the phone with them, this guy comes walking out of the field. He's an older man wearing a tan trench coat, and my co-worker and a customer ran back inside because this guy was hauling ass across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door, and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him he needed to go. The man was acting erratically, yelling at my cook and said, I'll end your life the next time I see you, fucker. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was flashing a weapon, but I couldn't see anything from inside. The cops get him down the road, and an officer came by and basically said the guy's homeless and not mentally stable. No shit. We told him everything that happened, and the cook pressed charges on him. The officer told us that there wasn't anything they could do, and he wouldn't give them his name, so they let him go. Basically, it ended with, Oh, by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. He came back again hauling ass across the neighborhood parking lot and back into the field. We could hear him screaming, yelling, Hey, come here, again and again. We got busy when the bars closed and haven't heard him yelling since, but I know he's still back there because I caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before. My manager comes in in the morning and I'm going to try to convince her to let me take a picture of him off of the security tapes so I can warn the other third shift workers. The field he's camping out in also backs up to a middle school, but the cops said, again, there was nothing they could do. Hopefully he moves on and leaves us alone, or the cops can get him on something where no one gets hurt. This happened a few years ago and still rattles me when I think about it. For context, I'm a female, and at the time I was around 25 years old. I worked in an office of around 150 people. One day I received an email from a co-worker, but I didn't recognize his name. The email basically said something along the lines of, I'm sorry if I did something to offend you. Given the situation, if you prefer never to see me again, I understand and will avoid you in the kitchen. I was extremely perplexed as I had no idea who this guy was, but I must have done something to offend this person, right? I responded back along the lines of, I'm so sorry if I offended you. Sometimes I zone out and it can be perceived as if I'm rude, so I apologize. After this response, he started getting irritated basically denying my apology and acting all passive-aggressive about it. I wish I kept a screenshot of these emails, but basically he was confusing the hell out of me with this misunderstanding. So I sent him a message suggesting we resolve this in person. Big mistake. He agrees to meet me in the kitchen in the office. I go there and immediately see a tall, 30-ish year old guy who I've seen around but never met before. I explained to him that I apologize, but I truthfully have no idea who he is, have never even met him before, and don't want any issues. What happens after made me very concerned. His face flushed bright red, and he looked visibly angry. He was stuttering and denying that I didn't know who he was, 
and then says, You've been staring at me for months. When you made eye contact with me, you gasped and ran away. Okay, what the fuck? I strongly denied this and told him it was a mistake, and he kept insisting that I've been staring at him for months and he could always see me doing it. Eventually, I realized he couldn't see reason and decided to end the conversation. Upon reflection, I realized that it's possible he thought I was staring at him because when you walk into the hallway next to the kitchen, there is a room with glass at the end where a bunch of desks are. His desk would be right in the line of sight if I was walking down the hallway, and he had a funny sticker on his desk I'd sometimes look at, but this seems like a huge stretch. After this incident, a co-worker pulls me over and asks me why I was talking to him. I explain the situation. She looked scared and told me that last year, he appeared in the office in bathrobe, raving like a madman at people, and he wasn't fired. Was I dealing with someone in the midst of psychosis? Was he dangerous? No clue, but I reported this ASAP to my manager, who took it seriously enough to tell his manager. I don't think he works there anymore. Thankfully, I left this company two weeks later, but I was extra cautious to not go anywhere near that guy. I encountered this on the 2nd of January when I was asleep in my room. I'm an 18-year-old female living in Singapore with my parents. In my family, it's only my mom, my stepdad, and myself living in a small apartment. I have my own bedroom as I'm an only child. My parents took the smaller room and I had the master bedroom, which has a big window that's facing the back of our house. For my bedroom, there's a big space outside of our window that's between every apartment unit over here, so there's no way someone would unintentionally stand near my window. You have to walk in and go for a few turns before coming here. I eventually fell asleep at around 11pm and I forgot to close my blackout curtains for my window. Even though it's a frosted window, anyone can see through it if they stood close enough to it for a closer look. Exactly at 1.23 a.m., I heard three loud knocks on my bedroom window, which eventually woke me up as I'm a very light sleeper. Where I'm sleeping, my window is on the right corner, and I can see whatever shadow that projects through it, day or night. On that night, the only light I had on was my table lamp that was facing me at its highest brightness. At first, I was sleeping while facing my room door so I had an automatic response to turn my head and look at what's knocking on my window. To my surprise, I saw a silhouette of a man's head that was clearly visible on my window. I had goosebumps. I froze because I was unsure of what to do as the curtains were wide open, so obviously that man's intention was to look at me through my window. Despite my parents' room being right next to mine, I went into shock and had to call my mom to help check if I was tripping and to also close the curtains for me. I told her what I saw afterwards. In the end, she advised me to sleep in the living room for the meantime to calm myself down. I felt really uneasy that night and I couldn't go back to sleep. Since I stayed awake that same night, I heard three more knocks coming from my bedroom at 3 a.m which, of course, I had to assume it came from the window. Before this happened, my curtains were already closed and blocking my window's view, so I thought that it would be fine for me to go ahead and get a little look on who or what knocked on my window. The only difference this time is that the knock was louder but slower, like the ones you would experience if you're in an old haunted house. Come to think of it now, I wish I stayed in my living room. I had my face and hand holding onto the window since I had to get a closer and clearer look, since I didn't see a silhouette when I was standing from a distance from the window, and me still being paranoid from what happened hours before. I saw a man who was around 180 plus meters standing outside of my window, about 4 meters apart, standing and staring right at me who's currently frozen in place at the window when I saw him. 
He was wearing long gray pants and a black t-shirt. He was really, really pale. It looked as if he had no expression when he saw me. By the time it happened, I wasn't really sure if it was the same man that stood outside at around 1.30 a.m. As tired as I was that night, I knew I wasn't hearing things or seeing hallucinations. I was perfectly wide awake when I saw that man. Moral of the story, always check your windows before going to bed, and it's best to get a blackout curtain to protect yourself. I am a psychiatrist, and during my training years, I worked for six months at a ward treating patients with depressive and anxiety disorders. It was an old building which had been housing psychiatric patients since the mid-1920s. On our floor, we had 13 beds and a nursing station, a living room, and a few conference rooms. One day, a few weeks in, I am interviewing a patient who, when asked about sleeping patterns, tells me she heard a baby crying at night, waking her up. There are no babies in that hospital, as the place is situated far away from housing areas, and there were restricted visiting hours. Afterwards, the nurse pulls me aside and tells me that the baby crying thing is not a psychotic symptom. She is very serious about this, but won't elaborate. I kind of shrug it off, as either way it does not change the diagnostic or treatment and I forget about the experience. Around three months into my stay, I sit in the nurse's station and three nurses behind me are talking. One of them says, she's very active today, and another responds with, really? Oh, I hadn't noticed. I turn around and ask them who they are talking about. They look at each other, and then one of them hesitantly says, well, there is a baby here. She cries sometimes. I of course say, no, but they just kind of shrug and smile. Not 30 seconds later, I hear it. It sounded far away, but not too far. A cry, clearly a baby's cry, sounding like it is separated from us by maybe two or three walls. I'm perplexed and look at the nurses. They look at me like, told you so. I of course ask about this, but they can't say anything else, but this faint baby cry is there, and has been there always. Since then, I heard it maybe two to three times a week. I told a new doctor about it, who laughed. However, a few weeks into her stay, she came to me white as a sheet, and told me she heard it on her coffee break. All the nurses just kind of knew about it, and being in psychiatry, hearing that kind of stuff is not really something you brag about. I was transferred, and haven't heard it since. I think about it sometimes, but I don't really know what to make of it. For some context, I'm female, and this happened a couple of years back when I was around 26. This happened in a big city. I was out with my dog, a little chihuahua, heading to a vet appointment, but I was pretty anxious and focused on getting to the vet ASAP. I was wearing a mask because it was in the middle of the worst part of the pandemic, and I was wearing a t-shirt with my university on it. I suddenly lock eyes with a guy on the sidewalk, headed in the opposite direction, and he comes up to me while I was walking and says, You went to NYU? I said yes and he started to walk with me along the sidewalk, the opposite way he was headed. He was right by my side, explaining what a great school it is, and how he's in grad school there. Somehow I felt like this was very unlikely. He looked 30 plus, and didn't seem to know anything about the college, and didn't give any details. He starts asking me more questions, and at this point, I'm speed walking down the block, and he just keeps walking right next to me. My dog at this point is getting really antsy, and I'm incredibly uncomfortable, as I have no clue who this guy is, or why he's trying to walk with me on a busy sidewalk. Suddenly my dog starts to bark and growl at him aggressively, and he doesn't seem to care and just keeps walking with me. At this point, 
It's been like five to ten street blocks, with me trying to keep my dog from growling and barking, and him asking me questions. I tried to explain I'm going to a vet appointment, but I was nervous. Eventually, he says, can I see you without your mask? I legit flat out say no, to which his eyebrows go up like he's shocked. He keeps pushing, and I keep flatly telling him no. Then he tells me he wants me to go get coffee with him, and inviting me to go with him. I decline and tell him I have a boyfriend, and assured him I was getting engaged soon. My dog is still flipping an absolute shit, barking aggressively at him. But finally, after like 10 streets, after he realized I'm taken, this guy departs and leaves me alone. Now, I know the most likely explanation is, guy thought I was pretty, wanted to ask me out on a date, and he was awkward. But holy shit, please do not follow a young woman down 10 streets who you don't know. It was unnerving, and I still remember this years later. I guess he made an impression. When I was around 12, I lived with my mother in a granny flat. The flat was connected to the old person's house and was built by his son. The neighbor was called Harry. There were three ways to enter the yard, one being from Harry's backyard, one being by the driveway, and the other being the main entrance. The gate at the driveway was broken, and we kept Harry's gate blocked. Harry was an odd guy, around 70 years old, and always gave me and my mom the creeps. But I remember one day, when me and my mom were outside, he started talking to us over the gate, and got on what we later learnt was a step stool, and my mom told me to go inside. Another time was when I was taking out the rubbish, and when I turned around, he was behind me, just staring. I tried to leave, but he dragged me into a conversation, and after a while, my mom showed up and asked what took so long. And when she saw Harry, she told me to go into the house, and when she came back, she told me that if he ever does that again, to run away. The third thing I remember is when I was home alone, and I heard the gate open, so I took a look outside, and I saw Harry walking around the yard. I ran into my mom's room and stayed quiet. After a while, I heard knocking, and the gate opened and shut, indicating that he left. The final issue was when me and my mom were mowing the lawn, when I felt I was being watched. I looked up, and there was Harry standing near his back door, just staring. After a minute, my mom realized I was staring at something and looked up. She immediately got mad, telling me to get inside and lock the door. My mom started yelling at him, saying, What are you doing? Go away. Leave us alone. If you keep this up, I'm calling the cops. I don't really remember what happened next, but after a few months, we moved, and it was the biggest relief ever. My mom told Harry's son what had happened after my mom yelled at him, and I'm guessing the son told his dad to leave us alone, but it was definitely creepy. To give context, I used to be a 911 dispatcher for a small city. We dispatched all law, fire, EMS for the entire county, and within this county were multiple law agencies. I had been there for about three months or so when I met him, Jake. Jake had recently transferred from a big department in California and landed himself randomly at our department. It didn't make much sense as to why he left California in the first place, but he always insisted it was just time for him to move to a smaller and less dangerous department. Him and I quickly became close and would chat almost every day after I got off shift. Within a few months, it became apparent that we liked each other and our flirting progressed into something more serious. Fast forward a few months later, and it turns out he was doing some inappropriate things to photos and videos of me whilst he was actively on duty. This, and a few other things he'd kept hidden on duty, led to him losing his license and leaving. During the process of his termination, 
His sergeant had suggested I get a protective order against him, as he'd made threatening statements previously towards me. Things such as, You better be telling the truth. I'll find out Tuesday if you're lying to me. I had began to fill out the paperwork, and was told I had a temporary protective order on him in the meantime, but I don't think I ever did. About two weeks after his termination, he calls me to catch up. The entire call is like an old friend to an old friend. What am I doing for work? Do I have a boyfriend now? But progressively turns more personal. When does my shift end? What do I drive? Being 18 and naive, I treated him like I always had, answering his questions. I had contacted his old department afterwards, as his sergeant had told me to let him know if I was ever contacted again. But they turned me away pretty quickly and didn't want anything to do with it. With that, I blocked Jake. Roughly a month later, I get a call from a new number, and it's Jake. Once again, he wants to meet up and catch up. But this time, he so casually goes on to tell me about this new house he's wanting to buy in my neighborhood, knowing it's my neighborhood. I had never told him where I lived in town, let alone what specific neighborhood. During this call, he progressively got more aggressive as well, making statements such as, If I knew I was going to get canned, I should have just had my way with you. He half-heartedly joked about getting a hotel room just for me, and that was that. A few days later, he FaceTimed me, and once again came off as simply wanting to catch up as he was sick. Midway through our seemingly normal conversation, he makes it apparent he's been touching himself this entire time. Keep in mind, nothing suggestive was mentioned, and our conversation at that point was about his new dog. He's blocked once again, but has tried to follow my social media, and now I've started to see him in my area. Last I knew, he lived nearly 30 to 45 minutes in the opposite direction from me. Am I reading too much into this? Or should I genuinely consider this stalking? As any typical 24-year-old, I'm very independent. I have multiple chronic illnesses which disable me, so my independence looks a little different to what yours might. For example, I use a wheelchair when I'm out and about or in the house if I've got an active injury and can't walk, like a bad hip dislocation. I recently got a new wheelchair, and there's one particular feature I made sure I had, or more accurately, didn't have, because of a situation that has happened to me a lot, and one event that left me fighting for my life. My new chair doesn't have push handles. I've always hated when people lean on my chair, or in public, a stranger just grabs my chair by the push handles, and starts trying to help me. If I needed a push, I'd have someone with me. As it is, I have a power assist application called a smart drive. My smart drive has given me my independence back, as I did used to be reliant on others to push me. But now my nifty little fifth wheel does the propelling for me, and I can roll alongside my friends, get up hills, and it generally just means I can leave the house alone. But some people see a wheelchair and assume the helpful stranger position and go in for the push. Not only is this incredibly annoying, but rude. How would you feel if you were just minding your own business, crossing a road, and someone started pushing on your legs, or just swung you on top of their shoulders and carried you off? Anyway, I digress. This incident happened back in 2019, so pre-pandemic times and I was out and about doing some shopping. My old wheelchair had push handles because I hadn't started off with a smart drive, just my manual chair. But at this point, I did have my smart drive, hence me being out by myself. I also have been wearing a mask for longer than the rest of the country due to severe allergic asthma. My main triggers are industrial or environmental particles, sprays, perfumes, and cigarette smoke. So picture this. I'm outside wheeling along on my own, wearing my fog mask, window shopping basically. And then I wasn't. I was whizzing forward. My first thought being that I trapped my waistband accidentally and started the smart drive up. 
but I very quickly realized someone was pushing me. I tried to hold my push rims to break and turned around to tell them, I'm fine thank you, I don't need a push, and I actually have an electric box that pushes it for me. But this person just didn't care. They started laughing a strange forced laughter, and I became more firm. Seriously, let go, I'm fine. This person didn't bat an eyelid, they didn't give a fuck, they just kept pushing me and said loudly in a patronizing manner, yes, we're going home now. At this point, we're going pretty fast and heading in a direction I really did not want to go towards on account of it being a very industrial area where I know the traffic is bad, buildings are being demolished for the HS2 railway and lots of people smoking at bus stops. I still have my mask on, but I start trying to reach out to strangers, shouting for someone to help me. No one did. Everyone shrunk away, staring wide-eyed at the crazy disabled girl in the chair and her poor carer having to rush her home with a variety of excuses. Oh, I told you we don't grab people. Yes, I know we're getting tired and you're overdue for meds. Let's not ruin anyone else's day. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. She's in a lot of pain and gets hysterical like this. As he rushes me past a long line of bus stops, several smokers worth of fog beginning to penetrate my mask. Seriously, get the fuck off of my chair. I need my inhaler. Let me go. We kept going and turned down a quieter street where there were literally bulldozers and wrecking balls and the air was thick with dust. I'm getting scared. I'm wheezing. I'm really panicking now as I know we're headed out of town and I have no idea where we are going. Finally, he fucks up, stopping my chair, coming around in front of me and ripping my mask off and begins to say, listen you little shit. But before he could get any further, I surprised him with a very forceful kick in the crotch. He counted on me being paralyzed, I guess, and didn't count on two things. One, my legs working enough to defend myself, and two, the power of panic and fight or flight when a person's throat is closing up. As he recoiled from the hard kick, I did what I've seen people do in films and brought my hands together and down onto his back as hard as I could, which I think winded him as he let out a wheeze almost as loud as my own. He dropped my mask on the floor in his panic, and whilst he was backing away, I reached around to my rucksack to grab my inhaler. I immediately took two puffs whilst he was cursing and screaming at me, but my ears had blocked up and my vision was going funny. A couple of the builders had seen the commotion and come over the road to see what was happening, and I pointed at the man, wheezed out, help, I don't know him, before I blacked out. When I came back, I was being lifted onto an ambulance gurney with paramedics and a builder around me. The man who had commandeered my chair was gone, and I had a nebulizer and oxygen blasting through a mask over my mouth and nose. I have never been so glad to take a breath. My vision was still swimming, and I felt like I'd been jabbed hard in my throat and couldn't really squeeze any words out. They loaded my chair onto the ambulance, and then we went off to the hospital. When the builders came over and I blacked out, one of them saw my inhaler, saw that my lips were blue, heard my wheezing and immediately called 999, and the guy who'd almost killed me took off. Another builder tried to chase after him, but he didn't catch up and the guy got away. The one who'd called the ambulance came with me to the hospital, and I've since become good friends with him. My family will forever credit him for saving my life that day. The police came to see me whilst I was still in hospital and had me report what they called an attempted kidnapping. Kidnapping. At the time I hadn't even thought about what the outcome might have been, but once the police had talked with me, I realized how lucky I truly was. That man could have done anything to me, and if he'd picked someone who couldn't use their legs, it could have ended very differently. They spoke to the builder who chased after the kidnapper, but they were never able to catch him or even ID him. In terms of the wonderful Leroy, 
The police and my asthma nurse commended him on his quick thinking, and I bubbled with his family during the pandemic. Leroy, thank you for saving my life that day. And kidnapper, let's not meet again. At 19, I was hired for the role of a correctional officer. I was one of the youngest there at the time, working at the most dangerous prison in Australia. I had worked there for 40 years, seven days a fortnight, 12-hour shifts. While it sounded like a pretty laid-back role, easy money really, the toll it takes on the mind is unimaginable, to the point where no money could encourage me to redo my time working there. There were good times where the men I worked with would better themselves and make something out of their lives afterwards, but I saw all manner of things, from courtyard fights to someone playing with themselves in public, to murder and people ending themselves, but none of that is what stuck with me through my time there. You would think so, but no, the one thing that stuck with me in my time there was a short-lived and supernatural experience. There was not a single drop of blood spilled during this experience, yet it was one of the most horrific and graphic things I have ever witnessed. It was a night shift. The shift started at 7 p.m. and finished at 7 a.m. We rarely did night shifts, and this was my first one since finishing training. What usually was a staff of about 200 people had dwindled down to about 30 by 10 p.m. We weren't left alone per se, but we generally did rounds on our own every hour or so. I was prepared and ready to take on the night, and being the youngest on the team and presumably the most naive, there were rounds of light-hearted teasing directed towards me. You'll have aged to 60 by the end of the night. Be aware of the night crazies, young Padawan. The start of the shift was quiet, peaceful almost. No issues, no weird bumps in the night. The inmates were quiet, dead asleep in their cells. It was probably around four in the morning. Tiredness was really starting to sink in when I saw a figure shift out of the corner of my eye, just outside of the unit. At that point, I just brushed it off as being sleep deprived and left to myself while the other staff members did their rounds. However, when I saw the figure move back to where it first initially moved from, my alarm bells started going off, quietly at this point. I turned in my chair to face the windows that looked out into the courtyard and focused my eyes on where I saw the figure move to, attempting to peer through the darkness. I saw it, just a shadow, but there was something there. Now, usually if we saw something strange, we should radio it in, in case it was a loose inmate, but this wasn't a human figure so I put it down to maybe being an animal, which, as large as it was, was incredibly unlikely. This was a maximum security prison. Nothing larger than a rat should be getting in. It took my tired brain longer than it should have to process this information. The alarm bells, that just moments before were a simple quiet whisper of something may be wrong, were now blaring. My now fatigued mind and body were awake, every nerve burning, ready to take action. I leaned over to the control panel and flipped on the outside lights. Nothing, nothing was there. Just me and my embarrassing labored breathing filling the unit. My radio cracked. My supervisor had seen the lights flipped on from the unit that she was currently doing rounds in. I had told her I thought I'd seen something moving outside, but it was most likely just my eyes playing tricks on me. She laughed back and said something that caused my skin to break out into a chilled sweat. We said to be careful of the night crazies. This is a lonely time and the crazies are lively tonight. Really, it's a sentence that doesn't entirely make sense. Unless crazies was a descriptive word of someone or the name of something. I brushed it off as her and the team trying to spook the literal new kid on the block, but still... Something lingered inside of me that told me that something was not right. 
I had half an hour of tainted peace before the next encounter with this shadow. Except this time, it wasn't outside. It had started as simple quiet tapping. Maybe it was the wind, but it's coming from the inside. Well, then maybe it's one of the inmates awake and bored. During the day, the inmates would cause a muck if they were confined to their cells. From tapping, to banging, to blood-curdling screams. The thing was, after a few minutes of thought, it was coming from one of the unoccupied cells. I was still alone at this point, but my unit partner should have been arriving back soon after finishing their rounds. I had stared at the cell door for a few minutes, trying to determine what to do, when the tapping sound suddenly stopped. My previously furrowed brow softened into a picture of surprise, but mostly relief. Almost immediately after relaxing, the scraping started. A long, painful sound, like someone drawing their nails across a blackboard. I cringed at the sound initially, but then panic took over. It wasn't a loud and deafening sound, but it was there. It was happening, when it shouldn't have been. I racked my brain on what to do. Radio in. Strange noise coming from unoccupied cell, going to investigate. My unit partner gave their affirmations and reported that they would only be a few more minutes. That it's probably nothing, and that I don't need to wait for them to check in on the cell. I wished they'd asked me to wait. I stood there, and then walked over to the cell in a daze. Not even a single hesitation. This outward confidence was at war with my insides, my heart pounding, my brain screaming for me to stop, and my lungs burning for air. My stomach was tied up in knots, and even with these warnings that something was terribly, terribly wrong behind that door, I didn't stop myself reaching for the latch. I opened the door. I hadn't turned on the cell light. They all turn on at the same time, and I didn't want to wake the inmates. The only light poured in from the central unit, my shape blocking most of it, letting a few dim streams through. I stepped in. I don't know why. We aren't allowed to step into a cell before inspecting it, but I did it anyway. I stepped inside and into the corner to let more light in, and I saw it. It was facing away from me, a crouched humanoid figure. Its skin was a sickly green-gray color, its knees bent forward, the kneecaps facing towards me. Its limbs were long and skinny, its joints large bulbs protruding from underneath its skin. It didn't even acknowledge me. It just raised its long arms up above its head, placed the tips of its grotesque digits against the concrete wall of the cell, and ever so slowly dragged its fingers down. I'd been silent up until this point, the fingers were halfway down its path when I let out a small gasp. It paused, just for a second, then it started to stand, its perverted knees cracking as it did. I was frozen. Its head was set on a dangerously long neck that was almost the length of its demented body. It had to stoop so that its head wouldn't hit the roof. Then it started to turn, but just before I saw its face, the room went black. The door had shut, and I crumbled to the floor, screaming for what felt like hours. But in reality, it was only 30 seconds, according to my partner, who had ran to open the cell door. I was sent home early that day. I expected to hear something about it when I went back into work, but there was nothing. Not even light-hearted teasing. It was like nothing had ever happened. A few months after the event, when I'd finally settled back into a normal routine, I did some research on the prison. Many old Australian prisons had wretched pasts filled with torture. This particular prison was notorious for it back in the day. Abuse, torture, hangings and riots. I wish I had not researched the history of the prison I worked at, because up until that point, I convinced myself that I was simply sleep deprived. Although that doesn't explain the cell door closing shut and locking. For the most part, the research brought up nothing too daunting, just the typical graphic and gruesome history of Australian prisons. However, 
I unearthed a diary entry that was written by a man from those dark times, and one of his last entries really put the nail in the coffin for me. It stayed burned in my mind for these last forty years. This is what his entry said. The walls we tap to make song are the same walls we scratch. Our nights are loops, and our hunger destroys our truce. They break our legs, and for daylight we beg. Instead, they stretch out our necks with their noose. Hey, this is my first ever post on here. I just wanted to share a couple of creepy and strange encounters in my hometown in Ontario, Canada. This first encounter that specifically haunts me to this day happened three years ago in the summer of 2019. I was 16 at the time. I'm a pretty big, built guy, but I'm not the most confident when it comes to encountering some of the nutters you can encounter in Ontario. I was walking home from my local grocery store after going on a late night snack run as I had plans of just gaming late with a couple of buddies that evening. This isn't a super long story, but basically I was about halfway home when I had noticed this homeless guy on a bike that seemed to be following me. I had recognized him before, as funnily enough, about nine months earlier I had purchased him a coffee and a bagel during the winter months from my local Tim Hortons, so I figured maybe he recognized me. I glanced back a couple of times and it noticed he was still on me. I crossed an empty parking lot, and I felt like he'd gotten closer, and he had. He was speeding up and was coming in hot, until I pretended to reach into my pocket for a knife. And then as soon as I made that motion, he made an impressively quick sharp turn and sped off in the other direction. Again, it's not the creepiest thing, but it's still one of the more strange things that I've had happen. I couldn't tell you what his motive was. I had no idea if he wanted to jump me or rob me. Not a clue. This second encounter is a bit more unsettling. I was walking home from what my job was at that time. I worked at a Wendy's around the corner from my house, and I just finished my first closing shift. I had noticed, about halfway down my street, there was a guy just standing almost in the middle of the road. As I got closer, I realized it was someone who actually lived at a house that was about six houses down from mine, and he'd gotten onto his knees and started muttering random words and quotes from actors and movies. I'm pretty sure he was just on something, but he was shouting and smiling like a manic person at one point. He ended up chasing some guy walking his dog right as I had looked back when I got to my front door. Hands down, some of the wackiest shit I've experienced. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene, we lived in a transitory neighborhood that was chocked full of abandoned houses and crime, with a few occupied residences and businesses scattered about. There were zero streetlights or illumination. Envision a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian, and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store slash from my place to his were absolutely idiotic on my part but after living in that environment for years, you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner, by then, would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I wanted my drink. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can, hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, and that kind of thing. I told him I didn't have anything and started to cross the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. 
He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down the pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably six foot seven, crazy tall and really thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then, but this was way more aggressive than anything I'd faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him I was heading to my partner's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. I said that he was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him, and took off speed walking down the street as fast as I could. He called after me several times, and then I heard his quick footsteps as he decided to follow me down the street. By then, I could feel my heartbeat in my eyes. My mouth had gone dry, and I was almost hyperventilating with fear. Trying to stay quiet so this asshole wouldn't hear me, I had this feeling that to show fear or to look back at him would cause him to react violently right away. So I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. My legs were no match for his crazy long stride and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. I tried to walk faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me. I could hear his breath in my ear, and I got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to. The neighborhood is pitch black, and there's no real through traffic. Not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I'd be powerless, save for trying to run from him. But with his height advantage, I knew he'd catch me fast. Then I could see my partner's driveway, and him standing at the end of it, waiting for me. He had this terrible feeling and already worried constantly about me walking at night so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, and then my nerve broke and I started sprinting towards him, and the tall guy behind me started to run after me. I reached the place where my partner stood and squeaked out, help, or something like that. I dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall guy to pull out a gun and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. It didn't happen. He gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible. Then I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around and then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterward, up at the store or walking up and down the street. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk. I still sometimes have nightmares about it. This is the late 80s, early 90s. I was around 6 to 7 years old. I'm at home with my sister, who's 14 to 15 at the time. We grew up in a small Texas town. Everyone knows everybody. We're home alone this particular night, and my folks let my sister babysit me frequently. We always got along due to our age gap. It's about 8pm in the winter, so it's dark, and we're in the common room since that's where the TV was watching 60 minutes or 48 hours or hard copy or some shit. It was one of those news pieces on CBS that chronicle large crimes and death, things like trafficking, murders, kidnappings and the like. Basically a gritty lifetime special. This one was a typical story. Guy next door that was quiet went on a rampage in his next door neighbor's house, mutilating them and kidnapping their young daughter. Well, the thing about our house common room 
is the door leading to the backyard was a large glass door on a wall of floor-to-ceiling windows. Nothing but blackness beyond it, unless you have the back light on, which we did not. The front door is on the other side of the room with a small entryway. This is a solid door, so you cannot see what's beyond it, with the glass storm door on the outside of it. About 45 minutes into the show, they're talking about the ongoing manhunt for this crazy guy, and all of a sudden there's banging. It's coming from the front door. We jump the fuck up and scream like banshees. Dead silence now. The only lights on in the house are the kitchen down the hall from the common room we were in, and the light from the TV. We start thinking something on the porch had simply blown against the door. This was West Texas, crazy strong winds out that way. Well, a minute or two of silence and us holding each other post-adrenaline overdose passes. Just when we are about to declare everything is safe, we hear the storm door on the outside of our front door close. Fuck. Someone had to have opened the door to be able to bang on the front door like that. Shit. We're both frozen in the middle of the room, on the floor, where we've been watching TV. My sister crawls over to the TV and turns it off. It was an old TV, so you had to turn the metal dial to switch it off, which it does with a mildly loud thunk. Now it's just us in a room dimly lit by the kitchen light down the hall. I do not remember how much time passed with me frozen and my sister still crouched by the now-off TV, but we kept making eye contact, then looking at the front door. I remember this part vividly. I'm on my knees, sitting on my feet, and I turn around to look at the back wall of windows and glass door. We hear, and I see, the back doorknob turn. It was locked on the knob, but not deadbolted. It rattles slightly, as if someone is gently trying the handle. Neither of us make a sound. We just held our breath. And then banging, loud as hell as if someone's trying to force the door open, just jerking it back and forth. The whole wall of windows is vibrating violently, and I can see with each jerk of the door how my slight reflection gets fuzzy, then clear, and then back to fuzzy. My sister flips her shit and screams bloody murder, I'm still frozen on the floor. She gets up and basically drags me into her bedroom, slams the door, and throws her mattress and anything she can in front of her door. Thankfully, she'd remembered the phone. One of those ungodly heavy, beige plastic, long metal antenna portable phones. We still had to direct dial the sheriff there, and in her panic, she didn't remember the number. She just hit redial on the phone. It was one of her friends, and she tells them in broken gasps that someone is trying to get into our house, and they need to get there right now. I'm curled up on the floor and cannot stop shaking. We don't hear anything else until we see the lights of my sister's friend and her parents driving up to the house. We never did find out who was at the door or why. There was no signs that anything happened, except a couple of scuff marks at the bottom of the back door that we couldn't remember if they were there beforehand or not. Nothing like that has happened to me or her since, but we for damn sure never forgot to lock a door after that. I grew up in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I was 12 years old, and let's just say I didn't have the easiest of upbringings. I was smoking, drinking, and staying out late around this time of my life. So I was bunking off of school, my mom was at work, and it was late morning time around 11am. I wanted to buy some cigarettes, but as I was well under the legal age, I had to hang around outside the shop and ask strangers if they would take my money and purchase them for me. About a mile and a half from my house, there was a little shop called the Spar. It was on a fairly busy road. A row of hedges lined one side, with a gap that led into the field beyond, and houses on the opposite side. So I was standing maybe 15 paces from the shop, waiting for people to walk past so I could ask them to purchase my cigarettes. 
I usually second-guessed if they would be willing by how they looked. I asked a lady, maybe mid-forties, shoulder-length blonde hair, black business trousers, pink elbow-length jumper, looked like she smoked, and she said no. I asked a guy, maybe mid-fifties, shaved brown hair. He was wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. He ignored me. So I was getting desperate by this point and decided upon asking anybody that came by. Then I see a rather disheveled looking man coming up the road towards me, past the row of hedges. He was wearing dirty dark brown suit trousers and a button up dark brown dirty velvet jacket. He had a black bowler kind of hat on and he kind of limped a bit as he walked. As he got closer to me and I was trying to suss out if he looked like the type that would possibly purchase a 12 year old cigarettes. I noticed he was probably homeless and possibly in his late 50s to early 60s, but I thought, hey, he probably smokes, I'll ask him. As he approached me, I gave him the usual line, excuse me mate, would you please go into that shop and get some cigarettes for me? He stopped and thought for a second, then said, how old are you? I lied, I'm 15, almost 16, and he said, all right, which ones do you want? And held out a really dirty hand. I gave him my money and asked him to get some ten sovereign. I had the exact change. He goes into the shop and I'm waiting outside excited. I'm finally getting my cigarettes and can go home and chill out before I have to leave the house again to make it look like I've just got home from school. He comes out and gives me twenty sovereign. I miffed to say the least and say, but I only gave you enough money for ten, and I start panicking because I don't have any extra money on me to give him. At this point, he hooks my arm in his, holding my arm firmly to his side, and starts to walk back towards the hedge-lined road. All the while, he's telling me how I can make up for not having the extra money for the cigarettes. I'm kind of stunned at this point, and my mind is blank. I guess I was in some kind of shock. He leads me through a gap in the hedges and into the field, all the while talking non-stop, still briskly walking with my arm locked in his. He's telling me how I can come to his house and help him fix the roof tiles. I'm still in silent shock. The field is huge and I can see it leads into more fields and more fields. I can hear the cars behind me getting more distant. I can't see any houses for miles, there's just fields. He's still talking, but I'm not taking in what he's saying. My mind starts to race. I finally realize something about this isn't quite right, and I have to get away. As he's walking, still holding my arm, I suddenly and violently pull back with my arm straight. My arm slides out of his very quickly and he goes flying forwards and lands in a heap on the floor, and I take one big step backwards. I'm terrified at this point, but still in shock. I can't speak. He's laying on the ground, groaning and holding his leg. It's like he's in a lot of pain. Why do you do that for? You've really hurt me. Help me up. Help me up. He's holding his leg and puts his hand out for me to help him up. I'm frozen. My mind is racing so fast. I'm looking at this disheveled man right now in the eye, laying on the ground, groaning like he's in pain. But something about this situation didn't sit right with me. My gut was telling me to run. Don't help him. I bought you those cigarettes, didn't I? I helped you out. Why did you do this? You've hurt me. Help me up. I take another step backwards, all the while looking into his green eyes. All of a sudden he stops groaning and asking for me to help him up. He points his finger at me, looking me right in the eye and says, You're a smart girl. It was like an electric shock ran through my body, and I turn and run. I don't look back, I just run as fast as I can. When I'd gotten off the hedge-lined road and turned into the next road, I slow down as I'm out of breath. I start bawling my eyes out 
and I'm shaking uncontrollably. I keep checking behind me, catch my breath, and don't stop running until I get home. At the very least, I was terrified I'd bump into that man again, and I never tried to buy cigarettes from that shop ever again. Each year around this time, I open up my Time Hop app and I'm reminded of a night three years ago. Photos of softball sized black and blue bruises all over the right side of my body come up. I'm honestly somewhat thankful for that because it could have been much worse. I'll just never know. Three years ago, after a blackout Wednesday night with friends, I found myself locked out of my partner at the time's apartment at around 3 a.m. She was out with co-workers doing the same after her serving shift ended. We live in a big city, so I'd taken the train from where the night ended with my friends straight to her place and decided I'd just wait for her rather than head back home as the commute would be another half hour or so and my phone was dying. I was honestly just ready to sleep. In hindsight, I obviously just should have headed to my own apartment that night. After multiple texts and phone calls from me to her to come home, my partner being thoroughly annoyed with me was not in any rush to end their night. Drunk and upset, I sat inside the entrance gate to her apartment community and sulked. It was raining and cold, and I was exhausted. Putting myself in this situation all alone was my parents' worst nightmare, but at this point, my phone was dead. I didn't have enough cab money, and there was no way in hell I was walking 15 minutes back to the train to head to my own apartment. A few minutes later, a man in a ski mask, sunglasses, and an oversized parker walks up to me. I remember him so vividly asking, Are you okay? I responded that I was fine and to please stay away from me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, for a split second, he was genuinely concerned. I mean, here I was, a college-aged girl, sitting outside in the rain at 3am, completely alone. But, at 3am, you don't just approach a girl dressed like that and mean no harm. He then brandished an exacto knife and then asked, You sure you're okay? He picked me up with one hand while repeatedly striking at the back of my hood with the knife. All I could do was scream. I know I asked him why he was doing this, but I couldn't even bring myself to pull out the mace in my coat pocket. I was so stunned. Talk about fight, flight, or freeze. I don't know if it was a car that drove by or my screaming that caused him to stop. But after the longest 30 seconds or so of my life, he threw me to the ground and ran, leaving me with those awful aforementioned bruises. I'll be forever grateful for the thick hood on my coat. That came away with some knife cuts. Had my hood not been up, he would have absolutely sliced the back of my neck and head. My partner pulled up in a cab a few minutes later. At least I think it was a few minutes later. It was really a blur. I definitely went into a state of shock. We called 911 from her charged phone, stayed awake for the police to come and take a report, but we didn't hear much else afterward. There's a decent amount of crime in my city, so I wasn't really expecting much to come of it. What scares me the most is that number one, I still don't know what the man wanted. Number two, he knows what I look like and I have absolutely no idea what he looks like. And number three, I'm pretty certain I was followed all the way from the transit station to the apartment complex, which was a fairly long walk. Those three reasons still give me chills. Ski Mask Man, let's not meet again. When I was a teenager, I used to go out camping by myself. 
I had a spot where I liked that was across a few fences from my grandparents' house in the middle of nowhere. One of the places I cut through was a pasture full of cattle. Around cattle, especially cattle unfamiliar with me, I try to be very careful to not spook them, but otherwise cows are pretty easy going. This was about a mile from my grandparents' house and probably about two from my destination. The one time I remember, I slipped through the fence to find the cattle already freaked out. They were insanely agitated about something I was not aware of, so I stayed well clear of them as I went through the pasture. I had a good time camping that night and packed up the next morning. As I went back into that pasture, however, it was this ridiculously bad smell. It smelled like a skunk had fought with something in a fertilizer barrel of shit, and the barrel broke open. It was awful. I tried to look around for the cows to make sure they were not going to surprise me, and I could not find them. They were just gone. There was some brush and trees, though, so I thought they were just out of sight. I keep walking through the place to get home, and the smell is so bad that I set my stuff down at the fence line and decide to investigate. Well, I found the cows. All of them were shot and ripped apart. Someone had carefully shot them in the head with a bolt gun style thing and eviscerated all of them. It also drug them all into a little shallow ravine and piled the bodies up. It was horrible. I hightailed it out of there back to my gear. My stuff was gone, as in I set it right here on this rock, and it's not with an eye shot. A quick glance showed me there was not anything ripped out or fallen out, so something, or someone, had picked it up while I was 200 yards away for less than 5 minutes. I think Usain Bolt would not have been able to catch me on the way home. I've never heard anything else about those cows, and I did not go back to the old camping spot again. So this happened about three years ago. The story begins with me having to replace a large section of drywall in my house as I had a bad leak on the third floor bathroom of my house. I have a very trusted contractor that I've used and my family has used many times before. I've never had a bad experience. Either way, it's Saturday morning and I let his crew into my home. I pay no real attention other than saying a quick hello and opening the door for them to bring in their materials from their truck. I'm upstairs studying and minding my own business when my roommate texts me that one of the workers is possibly drunk. Now, a bit of backstory. There have been several times before where she has falsely thought that there are sketchy people on our block. We live in a city. However, they have always turned out to be construction workers or service people, so I wasn't exactly surprised. I text her back that it's okay because I've used this crew many times before, and because it was in the morning, he probably wasn't drunk. She insists he is to me, so being the male of the house, I decide to check it out. I walk downstairs and notice there is one guy who isn't working. He's just walking around aimlessly amongst the crew without a real purpose. He is a large, well-groomed white man, dressed in clean baggy casual clothing. I go up to him and he mumbles some absolute gibberish words to me that I cannot understand, and I can tell that he definitely isn't drunk, but that he might have some intellectual disabilities. In my mind, it was a better than good chance that he was a relative of one of the workers, given that they seemed comfortable with him walking around the work area. Fast forward about two hours. I have to run to a quick doctor's appointment, and while I'm leaving, I notice that the guy is sleeping on the couch in the living room. On my drive to the doctor, I decide to call my contractor, who is at another site, to let him know that one of his guys or relatives of his workers was sleeping on the job. He's extremely embarrassed when I tell him and tells me he'll call his crew to take care of the issue. Fifteen minutes later, I get a call back while I'm in the car. In a very timid voice, he tells me that the person isn't with them and that they have no idea who he is. My heart stops 
and like a movie, I literally swung my car around and started speeding home at top speed. I immediately call my roommate to tell her to lock herself in her room and that he's asleep, so not to do anything crazy. I then call 911 and explain the situation. I arrive to the house and wait for the cops to get there and was very happy that they brought two of the biggest guys they had. They enter my home and immediately question and remove him from the house. It becomes very obvious that he absolutely had no clue where he was, and after the cop told him he was lucky he wasn't shot, you could tell how scared he was. He apologized profusely to me and said that he was off his meds and was looking for a halfway home. He tells the cop he needs to get his bag, which he left upstairs. The cop obviously doesn't let him get it, but strangely makes me search for it and retrieve it. I have immediate flashbacks of Brad Pitt in Seven, so I wasn't too happy with the officer. Luckily, it was just filled with books. After this is all done, I go to do laundry and notice that this guy spilled detergent all over the walls and floor of the laundry room. I guess he tried to do laundry and forgot that the detergent goes in the machine, not on the walls. Also, cleaning up a gallon of detergent is nearly impossible. This takes place in the rural farmland of the southeastern United States. For those from around the area, you know there isn't much around except for old farmhouses, fields, and the occasional subdivision. When I was around 17 or 18, I was dating a girl who went to the same high school as me. Being teenagers, we needed a place to be alone, and what better than the front seat of my F-150? Often it was hard to find a place to park that was away from the road and was far enough away from everyone. One evening, as the sun was getting ready to set, I remembered an abandoned house with a long driveway and a tobacco barn off some old back road with no other houses. I'd been there before and explored the property. The house's roof had been abandoned long ago and currently had been used to store lumber. The house had no doors or windows left and the rest of the property was clearly in disrepair and didn't appear to be used at all. I figured this long forgotten property would make a good spot, so I drove my truck up into the driveway, far away from prying eyes. I put my truck in park, lifted up my center console, and put on the radio. As my girlfriend and I were talking, she suddenly stops with her eyes glued to the rearview mirror and says, Um, I think someone is here. I initially blew her off as I was fairly confident no one was around for miles, but I glanced in my rear view to see that a very beat up looking Ford truck had pulled directly behind mine and the door flew open. Out jumped a tall, dirty looking man holding what appeared to be a 30 6 with a weathered wooden stock. As I put my window down, the man advances, yelling all types of obscenities from the side of my truck. As he walks up, I hear the distinct sound of the safety clicking off of an older rifle. I froze as the world stopped around me. I'd never been held at gunpoint before. As soon as the shock wore off, I threw my hands up, and I see the man had his sights aimed on me, through the rear window of my truck. I looked over to my girlfriend, who was frozen in shock and somewhat cowered into the passenger door. I remember feeling helpless and reaching for my pistol I usually had between the seats, which I quickly realized I had left at home. This was probably a blessing in disguise, as the strange man was clearly belligerent and under the influence of something. I'm sure him seeing my pistol would have just sent him more over the edge. As my hands are up and my girlfriend is shaking in fear, I eventually mutter out, What's going on, sir? The man, through rotten and missing teeth, shouts, You sons of bitches come out here tearing up my field and ruining my crops. He clearly had mistaken me for some of the ATV riders around the area who would often wander onto private property and tear up the land. Upon inspecting the man more, he didn't look like any of the farmers I'd known around the area, having lived here 15 years at this point. I was fairly familiar with the local farmers, 
This supposed farmer looked maybe in his early thirties and looked to me more like the junkies I would see downtown. I replied to the man that I'd never been here before, nor that I was responsible for destroying his crops, trying desperately to defuse the situation. He wanted to hear none of it and continued to mutter while still holding me at gunpoint. I waited for a break in his incoherent babbling to apologize profusely and say, Sir, if I'd seen a no trespassing sign, I wouldn't have dared step foot on the property. The man advanced from behind my truck to open my window to yell, Didn't see no fucking sign. He didn't believe me. As I studied him, he continued to grip the rifle tighter and mumble to himself. I apologized some more and offered to leave when I notice he has completely blocked me in. There is nowhere to go. As soon as I mentioned leaving, he perked up and dropped the rifle ever so slightly, putting us out of immediate danger. My fight or flight briefly chose fight, but I knew there was no way to jump out of the truck and get to him before he could shoot. Time seemed to slow, and I felt like the silence that ensued lasted hours. He started to yell obscenities again, but he started to walk back to his truck. As he passes my rear bumper, my girlfriend and I exchanged glances. I had never seen a fear like that in someone's eyes, let alone someone I loved. I knew I had to do whatever I could to get away from this unhinged stranger. I fired up my truck and put it in reverse as he does the same. The beat up Ford backed into the road and stopped, waiting for me to exit. I backed into the road as well, my eyes never leaving the rearview mirror. As soon as there was enough space, I threw the truck into drive and stomped the gas pedal down as far as it could go. My tires squealed and the truck roared as it ran through the gears. I was familiar with the roads and was confident I could outrun him if need be, as his truck looked like it was on its last leg. As the speedometer flew past 60, I could see the man following us, but enough distance from my truck that it would be hard to put a hole in my tailgate. My girlfriend is calming down at this point and is trying to rationalize what just happened to us. I drove and drove for several miles, constantly looking behind to see if he was following me. I briefly remember doing over a hundred miles an hour at some point. The mood in the cab changed to utter disbelief as we talked how the crazy supposed farmer looked and awkwardly laughing off our near deaths. I never saw the man again after that and never returned to the abandoned house, except for the next day to leave him some ruts in the front yard of the rundown property. Looking back, I haven't the slightest idea as to how the man knew we were there, as we weren't visible from the road, nor were we followed. I personally think he was just some tweaker, as I knew most of the farmers in the area. And being in small town, you know everybody. I had never seen this man in my life, nor have I seen him since. I certainly was in the wrong being on private property and had heard horror stories of people running from crazed farmers as bullets flew over their heads. However, a couple of kids parked up in what was clearly a forgotten property. Several hundred yards from the nearest field shouldn't have warranted a firearm pointed at me and my girlfriend, who were sitting in a clean truck that obviously hadn't been tearing up any fields. Coming from a farming family and being close with the farmers in the area, the last thing you would catch me doing is tearing up someone's livelihood. Regardless, I put my girlfriend's and my life at stake just to park up somewhere and fool around. I never made that mistake again. My family is from a small town in East Tennessee. My father's side of the family seemed fairly normal. They were mostly tobacco farmers and were poor hillbillies. My mom's family, on the other hand, seemed like a disaster from everything I've heard. My grandfather would take my mom and aunt to bars and leave them in the car while he drank and wined women. He would beat my grandmother and berate her in front of the kids. My mother's side is part some kind of white European and Native American. My aunt, grandma, and grandpa 
all have dark black hair. My mother has auburn hair and freckles. My grandpa would call her a bastard and tell my mom that my aunt was the prettier daughter. My mom had even told me that her dad brought a drunkard home from a bar and that he did stuff to my underage aunt and forced my mother to watch. So, my mom had a good reason to want to escape home. During her freshman year of high school, she met my dad. He had gone to a revival at a church with his sister and started talking to my mom there. The preacher was a man called Gene. My mom and dad talked for a few weeks, but were never allowed to date. One night, my grandfather came home on a bender and beat my mother. My father ran away with my mom, and they eventually got married. The whole time, they kept following Gene from church to church as he preached. He was very charismatic and would preach for hours on end. He would become enraged and pant a guttural growl. He would be drenched in sweat by the end. My sister was born a year after my parents were married. I was born nine years later. My parents quickly indoctrinated my sister and me into the church after birth. The women weren't allowed to cut their hair. They had to wear dresses only and no makeup. Usual Southern Baptist dogma. Here's where things get weird. First was the ritual of getting happy. During the sermons, women, and sometimes men, would let out blood-curdling screams. The preacher would burst into tantrums and crawl around on the floor and speak in tongues. People would jump from their seats and speak in tongues while someone else translated. It all seemed like the run-of-the-mill Baptist happens on the outside. I started to realize things as I got older, and a few times I saw things that changed the way I feel about these people. My sister told me once, before I was born, that my father was chased by demons. He woke the family up in the middle of the night and told them that they had to leave before they were killed by demons, and that he had seen hell in a dream. My sister said, as they left the hollow where they lived, her dog walked in the middle of the road. He stood up on two legs and tried to block the car. My dad ran him over. My father was crying that he could see things climbing in the trees. They drove to my aunt's house and picked her up. Then they went to Jean's where he calmed the demons and prayed them away. My sister said my mom would do odd things like build altars in the woods and pray at them for hours alone. I have seen my mother fly into fits of rage and lash out at me or my sister, then forget that they happened. I was always reluctant to get saved. I always felt like something was wrong. During heated sermons, I would go into the basement of the church and pray that God would get me away from it. The two major events that made me believe something evil was afoot will be burned into my mind forever. One night, when I was three or four years old, the congregation was praying over a sinner and helping them get saved. I was sitting in the back row watching. I felt the room get cold, and then I heard a growl, the most deafening noise I've heard to this day. Then all of a sudden, the people stopped praying, and like zombies, the churchgoers walked back to their seats. The people sat there quiet for hours, then we all got up and went home. The other event happened when I was a teenager. We had gone to revival in the middle of nowhere. The church was stifling hot. The preacher had gone into a tantrum, and the people were screaming and dancing around the room. I started praying and asked God to let me leave. The back door of the church opened on its own. I stood up and walked out, and no one seemed to care. My parents didn't even come to look for me until church was over. I had a dream once that I was in church, and the lights turned to an amber glow. Gene was preaching. He told the people to stand up and follow him. The people stood and followed him out the door. They followed him into the woods to a well. There, he marched them in a straight line into the well. I could hear hell coming from inside the hole. Lastly, there were the animals. They would come to the church and harass the people. The church was in the woods, so I didn't think much about it at the time. 
A bear would come and scratch at people's cars, and deer would roam around the parking lot. I moved out at 18. My mother threw a fit at me and hit me and screamed at me. I never went back to church there again. My sister still goes to church, but it's one of those mega church deals. They seem really friendly and way different from the other church. That's that for now. There's too much to talk about in one post. I know there are others out there who have escaped. Please talk to me. I know it's still happening. I am an 18 year old female who used to live in Las Vegas before I moved recently. And if you don't already know, Las Vegas is number two on the sex trafficking list. I used to go out a lot at night to 7-Eleven and get snacks, because I was bored and wasn't tired. The one closer to my home I got banned from, so I had to go to the one a bit further away from me. I used to go by myself, and the walk there was creepy. Most of the street lights don't work, and it's just dark and really creepy. This time I ended up getting ice cream and some kind of candy. Anyways, on my way back, I'm about to get to the crosswalk to get to the side my house was on. I noticed a guy standing outside one of the other apartment complexes. He wasn't there before, but some of the apartments are facing the street I walk on. He started yelling something, but I wasn't sure if he was talking to me or not because I was on the phone with my boyfriend. I crossed the street and walked past him. Something felt off when I crossed the street and passed him and he didn't say a word. The only time he said anything was when I was across the street. Maybe he noticed I was on the phone. I kept walking and glancing behind me, nothing too obvious, and then he started yelling and walking faster. That was when I knew he was talking to me and following me. I told my boyfriend and he said just walk fast and try to get home. This guy was pimped out. I mean he was dressed like a pimp gold chains, expensive shoes and clothes, and everything else. I say this because I didn't live in a great neighborhood, and you wouldn't see people dressed like that without knowing what they did. Anyways, I noticed that he was speeding up every time I looked behind me. I started panicking because I was genuinely scared something was going to happen. But another guy passes me. We acknowledge each other and say hello casually. The guy that was following me sees this and runs across the street. In my head, I was like, this guy probably just saved my life because he said hi to me. He was just a random guy I'd never met before. I got home safe, but I'll never get ice cream at night alone again. I still feel sick to my stomach, and I'm honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light in the house on. Anyway, here it goes. I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service. Here in Australia, that mostly amounts to picking up orphan joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now, I don't drive, so I only do rescues in my area or in the relative nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods. That's animals with pouches or marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium-sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went. How? Why not? I got my rescue tub, which contains my essentials, and went on my way. The couple that called in the rue were at the entrance of the trail, and they told me where it was. I knew them. Our dogs liked to play together, and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about, and I trust them. They offered to come with me, but it was cold and late and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So, I politely said no, and that I got this. My area is very safe, and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So, I walked the 30 minutes uphill into the reserve, 
and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic, he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, definitely not a medium and probably weighed around 45 kilograms, more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities, so I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in the tub. I tie it with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I'm very used to the sounds of the animals in the night. The scratching, movements, hissing, growling, all that stuff. And since I had my head torch on the entire time, so I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You develop a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sound so well. I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago, before I got sick, and when I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right, and as sure as sure, every hair on my body seemed to stand on end. I'm on the balls of my feet. I scan the surrounding area, thinking it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused, but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is too heavy. I have to stop every few meters and put it down to stop the tub from cutting my hands. Then there was a large crack and movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way too big and there was sudden silence. Like whatever had made the noise, it stopped or was stalking. I decided to just fuck it. I pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light, and started booking it down the trail, sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees, leaving my tub behind. I doubt anyone would take it, and honestly, I was freaking out so much I couldn't give a fuck. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground. That was way too big for any animal in my area, let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time, my instincts are screaming to run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before I dared stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night, and the next day she came with me to try and find my rescue tub. This morning, another rescuer came to take the sick route to the vet, and me and Risa went back up to the bush. We found it. The heavy-duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like someone kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled cigarettes and a needle. I just silently picked up my broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think I'll be going out at night for a long... This story isn't one of mine, but it was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy, gated community in Orange County, California. It's called Kodo de Katza. We always visit each other, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime is something that's virtually non-existent. If it does exist, it typically is domestic violence within a household. I'm now 32, and my parents are in their mid-60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was locked, like doing so was some sort of religion. 
I always question this policy, asking, what's the point of locking all the doors and windows when we live out in an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have a key and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house or wait five hours in the yard just to be able to get into my house. It was quite annoying. Anyways, one night, one or two years ago, my parents awake to someone pounding on their door at around 2 a.m. after having fallen asleep watching SNL. My dad goes to answer the door, thinking it's my sister or me needing help. He opens the door without looking through the peephole. He was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old male. The kid starts telling my dad that he needs to get the hell out of his house. My dad tells him that he must be confused because this is his house and not the kids. My mom is in the other room hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad is apparently arguing with a very frustrated and angry kid to no avail and it's escalating fast. The kid simply cannot fathom the logic that this house isn't his and my dad has no way to convince him otherwise. Now, let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He's been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he's always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing the yard work and such. He's actually still much stronger than me, as evident whenever we work on cars together. So, after about five minutes of circular logic, the kid, in a fit of rage, decides to barge his way into the house, and my dad gets into a scuffle with him. My dad is punching, pushing, and kicking the kid, and taking many blows himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid outside and close and lock the door. This is when the kid goes nuts. He decides to go around the entire house, pounding and banging on every door and window. My parents are scared shitless and are terrified that he's going to break through a window or bust down a door because he's pounding so hard. This is the time my parents decide to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents are completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves if this kid is able to break in. My mom is terrified because they could never tell where he was going to start banging and kicking next. She described how she was amazed the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with extreme force. The cops finally get there. They find the kid in the backyard, banging on one of the back doors, and they have to taste the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints. After a while, they were able to figure out what happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door, but the older brother decided to pawn it off on his 19-year-old brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the house and was so high on bath salts, he got confused on what house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding in several places and was pretty bruised elsewhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press felony charges, but my parents said they were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. I thought they were being a bit too nice in this situation, but I guess it's their choice. My family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home, even with religiously locked doors and windows, in a gated community, was quite upsetting to them. The psychological after-effects of this ordeal are pretty apparent, as they're coming out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive, high-tech security system within a week or two of the event, and I could tell they were rattled by this event for a while, but they just didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not able to overtake the high kid. Oh yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother lived with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents' house and the house they were supposed to be sitting.
I'm just going to include several experiences I had while delivering pizza for a popular chain a long time ago. I live in a small rural town in the southeast US and it has the usual suburban developments as well as some more outlying country and rural areas. When I was younger, just as I'd moved out on my own, I worked as a pizza delivery guy. These are some of the creepy encounters I had during this time. Story 1. The Orgy One afternoon, I got a delivery order for an area of town I rarely, if ever, visited. It was on the east side of town, which was very run down and poor. An old textile mill used to employ many in that area, but had been closed for some time and been overrun with kudzu and had begun falling apart. The houses around this area often had failing foundations and were very old, rusty trailer homes. This particular order was to one of the trailer homes. I knocked and no one answered. I tried again for several minutes as I could hear music coming from the inside and I figured maybe they couldn't hear me. When they finally opened the door, it was a skinny guy with no shirt on and he asked me to step inside. When I walked in, there was a lady behind him who was wearing a robe and another sketchy couple standing at the back of the room. They had a boombox playing loud country music. These people were high and drunk, which I was used to, but this place was buzzing with crazy. All of them were at least 10 years older than me, and as I sat the pizza down and waited for payment, they started making sexual comments regarding my body. Whenever one would say something, another would encourage them to continue. Eventually, the guy who opened the door walked over to me and the lady behind him said, Go ahead and pay the man. He handed me the cash and put his free hand on my arm and in a hot breath of full natural light, he whispered in my ear and asked, We're all about to have sex. Do you want to join us? I said, no thanks, and made a beeline for the door. And story number two, the creeper. I got two orders from the same area of town I talked about before. One was a 20 pie order for a church fellowship hall, and the other a single pie for a residence. I dropped the pies for the church off first, then headed over to the last customer. When I arrived, I immediately noticed the house looking off-putting, dark and dirty. I was like, please let this be the wrong house, but it wasn't. There was a creepy, old, naked doll on the porch, and an empty birdcage hung from one of the trees in the side yard. I got out, grabbed the pizza, and slowly walked up to the house. I tried the doorbell, which was glowing, so I figured it worked. No one answered, so I tried knocking. Again, nothing. Eventually I got creeped out, so I started walking back to my car. Halfway to my car I heard, psst, and turned around to see an old man with wild and unkempt hair, literally peeking his head out from the back of the house. It was getting dark out, and my patience was draining, so I was not in the mood for someone playing games. I simply said, did you order this pizza, and waited for him to answer, but he ducked back out of sight. I started to just turn to leave, but then he peeked out again. I said, sir, is this your pizza or not? And finally he emerges. He walks up to me carrying a shovel of all things. He said, yeah man, sorry, I'm just messing. I don't mean nothing by it to which I just responded with the total and held the pizza out. Luckily, that was the end of the transaction, and I was able to get out of there. I worked the same job for a few years and had plenty more weird experiences, but I then moved on to find something better and safer. If you work delivering items to people at their homes, stay safe and never go inside their house.
It was April of 2008. I was 20 and living in Denver for a year-long work contract with a non-profit in Boulder. My girlfriend, now wife, and my best friend Tim drove to Colorado from our home state to visit me for my 21st birthday. The nonprofit I was working for housed their workers in dorm rooms, and drinking was not allowed on site, nor were visitors allowed to stay overnight. So I booked a hotel room in downtown Denver for the weekend, where we could drink in honor of my 21st. The hotel was big, very nice, and in a safe central area of the city. So nice, in fact that it was the same hotel that most of the politicians would later stay during the DNC convention of 08 that took place in Denver later that summer. My wife and Tim arrived Saturday morning and we all met up at the hotel. The day was fantastic. We drank across the city most of the day. By about 1 a.m. we got back to the hotel. The room was typical with two queen beds Bed number one was close to a big window looking out across the city. Bed number two was pushed against the wall with a door that opened to the bathroom. You couldn't see the door slash entryway to our room unless you were at the foot of bed number one. We drank more and chatted in the room until about 4 a.m. My wife was laying at the head of bed number two, flipping through the TV. Tim and I were seated at the foot of bed number one, staring out the window as we talked. As we talked, I heard some movement and the sound of a door opening. Without looking away from the window, I assumed it was my wife getting up to use the bathroom. A few minutes passed by, and I thought I heard movement again, so I finally turned around to look. I saw my wife still lounging in bed number two as she had been. Did you get up a few minutes ago and use the bathroom? I asked her. No, she replied. I thought I heard a door. I said back to her, with her just looking confused back at me. Yeah, I thought I heard that too, Tim said, breaking his own gaze from the window. It was then I started to run cold and sobered up pretty quick. Very softly, I heard Tim say, I think there's someone in our room. I lurched forward from the foot of the bed to look into the pitch black entryway. I could barely make it out, and I wanted to believe I wasn't seeing it. But there was a man, dressed in all black, with a black baseball cap, pressed into the 90 degree corner of the entryway, where the room door and wall met. Absolute silence fell on the room, and it felt like hours passed by as I started to panic in my mind like no way I ever have in my entire life. We all knew. We knew we weren't alone and hadn't been for a while. And he knew we spotted him. Eventually Tim got the courage to meekly speak in the direction of the entryway. And he said, Hey man, is there something we can help you out with? Another period of silence that felt like an eternity went by. He slumped off the edge of the wall a little into the light and made eye contact with Tim and I. We all just stared at each other. Then eventually he spoke up and said, Is this room 1709? No man, it's not, Tim said, stroking his beard nervously. He stared at us for a while longer, raising his eyebrows and shaking his head. He then turned around and left. We then erupted into a million curse words and paced around the room. I called the front desk. They told me that he was drunk and they found him in a stairwell, but they directed him back to the right room. Minutes later, Tim called the front desk and they told him he was not a guest. He was apprehended in the stairwell and taken into police custody. Then, a while later, they told my wife he disappeared and they had no idea who he was or what he was doing. They told her there wasn't even a room 1709 in the hotel. We got three different stories. We still have no idea what that was all about, or how he managed to get a keycard to our room. We were sure the door was closed. It was easily the most terrifying moment of my life.
always use the latch in hotel rooms. We got the stay refunded and about $200 in credit for food from the hotel. We should have sued, but we were young and dumb. I hope you enjoyed that guys. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind the scenes content. Thank you to Dixie Busby, Michelle Green, Misty Rakur, Michelle Brooks, Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Lindop, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Jennifer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marciana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Lowe, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madis Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel DeLuna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardell, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyera, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Rainy, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Ardiver, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, 
crafty cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.